Hello, welcome to another edition of the Sky F1 podcast. We're well into the lockdown now, and I hope you're staying at home and staying safe. We are. I hope you've also been enjoying all the content that we've been bringing you over the past month or so since we left Melbourne. I'm delighted to say good lineup today. We'll be hearing from Red Bull team principal Christian Horner a little bit later. First off, though, it's a warm welcome to Ted Kravitz and to Jensen Button joining us from LA and from over in Madrid. Carlos Sainz. Carlos, how are you keeping? How's things over there? Yeah, hey guys, all good here in Madrid. I cannot complain. Um, family's fine, everyone's doing fine. Just obviously trying to keep ourselves busy and entertained, like all of you guys, I imagine. It's been a long time, four weeks now, as you say. Uh, so it's starting to become quite a long, long time. But they, all in all, I cannot complain, as I said. Is it the family? Home there? I mean, are you shacked up with the three-time Paris Dakar winner, or is it <laughs> exactly? Yes, yes, yes. I'm I'm here locked down with my dad, uh, mum, and two sisters. Um, um, nice to spend some time with the family. As you guys know, we don't get to spend much time with them. Uh, my mum probably is the happier of all, no? Because uh, normally I don't see her much, and finally we got some time together. But I think we all agree this is starting to be a bit too much. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, all going fine. Um, playing some cards with mum, uh, training with my dad, um, playing some games with my sisters, and nice to catch up with them. Also, in quite a lot of stuff. What about, yeah. what about some lockdown goals, Carlos? I mean, we all want to, to come out of this, you know, better people than we went into it, don't we? But uh, what are your kind of lockdown goals? Are you finding you're getting a bit more time to spend to your, with your dad, kind of talking about stuff and memories and racing that he's done? And, or, or is it all about training for you? No, there's some, definitely some goals that I put together, for example. Um, I wanted to start understanding economics a bit better and the stock market. And since then, I've had a lot of chats with my dad, with the people who helped him out with obviously his invest, investments and all that. And I spent some time talking with him about it um, and obviously my staff. Also, I did a full clean of uh, wardrobe. You say it like that? Wardrobe, yeah. yeah. Um, and tried to donate that, those clothes and all that to maybe some, some organization or so to the church because I had an awful lot of things in my wardrobe that I didn't use. Um, what else? I've become the trainer of my family. Now I'm uh, Coach Carlos instead of Coach Rupert Mangwaring. And um, with the help of Rupert, of course, I'm uh, trying to coach my family, putting together some diets, some training plans, uh, trying to keep the family motivated, busy, especially because, you know, as you guys know, sports puts you in a good mood, puts you with some good uh, endorphins and uh, I think it keeps us all happy and entertained. Do you, um, do you have a training plan that you can, you can share with us? Um, obviously we're all on lockdown, we're looking for new ideas and new things to keep us all motivated to stay in shape. Is there anything that you, you know, that you, um, you love to do when you're training? Yes, um, I don't know if it helps us an idea, but for example, um, during this period of time, I decided that I wanted to go down from 72 kilos that I was down to 69. Um, why? Mainly because I'm having the chance to eat healthy food at home. I know many people are using this time to prepare a lot of uh, cookies, a lot of uh, <laughs> cakes and all that. But from my side, even if my mom prepares a cake every weekend, uh, I'm trying to you know, now that I'm living at home and eating healthy food, use it as an, as an opportunity, you know. I don't think you eat as well as you do at home in any place in the world. So uh, apart from that, um, I'm very lucky to have a, a home gym with a treadmill, with a spinning bike, some a lot of material from Techno Gym. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what you guys have or, or what you don't have, but I consider myself very lucky to have that and I use that to the maximum, you know, two sessions a day, um, Rupert criticizes me quite a lot sometimes because I uh, doing a bit of body, bodybuilding stuff, preparing for the beach, just in case it is allowed to go to the beach. But um, if I keep my weight under control, my neck uh, trained and, and all that, he, he allows me to do so. I've gone the other way. It's, it's difficult with a sofa and a PlayStation. That, that's, that's the lure of, of the kids as well. Um, I don't know about you, Ted. That's how I find it. Anyway, hey, Carlos, I know that... 
if you've got a garden there, if you've got, you know, as a keen golfer, with your father a keen golfer, if you built yourself a chipping green. That, yes, that's we don't have a green, like a proper green, but we do have some, a piece of uh, garden grass and we do this kind of um, approach. And uh, no more than 20, 30 meter approach, but it definitely keeps our swing going and our swing a bit more together. Um, I, I was keen on buying on Amazon a net to try and hit some drivers into the net and get a bit more the the anxiety out of the body, you know, with the hitting some strong drivers. But uh, at the moment, I haven't got it yet. I was going to say, how's the lawn? My lawn is, is hacked to pieces. A little bit like, Land that's a good little segue there, a little bit like Lando's hair. Um, can I just ask what you made of uh, <laughs> that shearing for charity? All in need of a good cause, but oof. It's tricky yeah, to what to say. I mean, hats off for doing it for charity, for his personal image. Uh, doesn't matter because it's for charity, but uh, hopefully he will come back in Formula One where, when that hair has grown up a bit. <laughs> um, Carlos, what about Formula One itself? I mean, I know uh, the, the factories are on a kind of extended summer shutdown now and everyone's you know, not in the factories, but your mind doesn't stop ticking over, does it? Are you having some ideas based on you know, the running you had in winter testing? Um, are you talking to, to your engineers, to Tom or whoever, and, and having ideas about something you might want to pick up on later? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, your mind never stops, and even less when you have so much time to think about it. I think at the moment, uh, one of the problems I personally have is that I keep thinking a lot about Formula One, about, uh, about racing itself, about the team, etc., and and it's difficult to put your mind out of that. The first two weeks, it was not a problem because I could have time to, to, to disconnect a bit and make sure I didn't get the infected and keep my quarantine and, and all that. But then after those two weeks, it's been a bit more tricky to, to keep my head out of it and uh, follow the news and all that. Um, I uh, have a conference call like this one every, every week with my engineers and we try to talk about Formula One and about all, all the things that are happening or all the rumors that we hear in, in the Formula One world. And uh, for example, I've had an idea recently that I wanted to take some, some kind of online engineering class with my engineer, Tom Staller. Um, I would like to know a bit better how some parts of a, a Formula One car work a bit more specifically, a bit more technical. I don't know how we're going to make it work online, but uh, I think it could work well, and uh, at least it will keep me busy, and I will use it as a as a, something to improve my I don't know my awareness of our Formula One car. I guess you miss Stellard's face, don't you? I do. Basically. His his massive smile whenever he smiles. He's like <laughs> <laughs> um, Carlos. So you're you're keeping fit, which is great. But um, I see a lot of the F1 drivers as I've driven with them. They're doing a lot of sim stuff. Um, and I've never really been into the simulator, but being on it more lately, your reactions do stay sharp and feeling a car is, is you know, it's, it's not 100% realistic, but certain things really do um, carry over. Um, are you going to get into the simulation world? I am already into the simulation world. Uh, first of all, obviously, as you guys may know, I am an ambassador for Gran Turismo, so I'm keeping myself busy on on Gran Turismo here in Spain. I'm doing a lot of online races for charity. Uh, maybe it doesn't get to the UK because it's all very uh, national here in Spain, but uh, I'm doing quite a lot of that stuff. Then um, I've just got my simulator where I can play the F1 game and uh, I some some I racing. The F1 game, I'm looking forward to try and join this weekend, but I haven't confirmed yet because I'm having issues with the brake pedal and trying to calibrate it to be decent at least, uh, but as soon as I get it done, don't worry because I'll be joining you, Jensen. Uh, you will probably have to represent someone else that is not McLaren because maybe Lando and me will take place. But uh, thanks for taking my place uh, recently and uh, doing a decent job at it. Booted out, Jensen. You've been boot getting booted out of your old team. That's amazing, that? isn't it? Well, I'm the only one that's finished a race this year out of all three of us, so yeah. <laughs> 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 always consistent eh? like in F1 always a good uh, consistent driver and is it a matter of keeping sharp on the simulators Carlos for me more than sharp 
that the, doesn't really worry me because as soon as the quarantine is over, I will go and do a bit of go-karting simulator at McLaren and, and that will get me back to sharpness. It's getting the competitive spirit up. You know, I, I love competing and even in simulators, I, I get so nervous in a qualifying lab or in a race or in a race start and that is what fuels me and what makes me then go to sleep saying, oh, at least I've been competitive for, for a bit of time you know and um i hate being slower than the professional gamers in gran turismo they are a couple of tens quicker than me still and i hate it so much and i try to copy their driving styles and and their tricks because every game has its own tricks and all that uh that uh yeah it keeps me competitive it gets me sharp um but especially as i said competitive i love the competition and the the pressure and when eventually the season gets going and, and we have whatever 15 16 or or or, or whatever races I mean, obviously, we're not, probably not going to have 22 races. Do you think that's going to change the racing? Is it going to be more important not to, not to have a retirement, for example? Because we're going to have, clearly we're going to have fewer races than 22 this year. Yeah, definitely. I think we are going to depend a bit more on, on consistency and a bit more on luck. Uh, for example, I think last year I did a run of races where I got only something like uh, 20 points and then another run of eight races where I got 50-something. So it depends in which time of the year you, you put those run of eight, ten races. You can have a great season or you can have a pretty average season. No? So uh, it will be more difficult to judge a season because you will depend a bit more on consistency and luck well, and mechanical failures and accidents and all that. But at the same time, it could create opportunities. It could create opportunities for, for other drivers. Uh, um, probably Mercedes will have to be a bit more careful just in case they get something wrong. and people in the midfield the same, you know, I think it's going to be a, a different season to what we are used to and maybe it could create opportunities for good and for the bad. Uh, so we, we don't know when the first race is going to be yet, obviously, it keeps moving. Um, but um, there was talk of it possibly being Austria. Um, and Austria isn't too physical, but um, still, you're going to be coming from zero to racing yeah. in an F1 car. I don't care how much neck training you do. I, I always found that when you jump in an F1 car, after the first day of driving, your neck is just agony the next day. I think that the, the race, uh, the first race we have back is going to be all about, well, obviously, the speed of the car and how quickly you adapt to being back in a Formula 1 car. But it's also going to be about fitness. And this isn't something we've seen in Formula 1 for a pretty long time because all you guys are super fit. But um, it's going to be interesting to see if you guys can hold your head up for a whole race. Yeah, I mean, it worries me as much as you, uh, Jensen. I think that's the only thing that drivers cannot keep uh, fit, as fit as, as any other thing in the body is the neck. Maybe a bit the core muscles. I always find the first day of testing that my, my stomach hurts a bit um, after 100 laps. And, um, and it's a bit more difficult to digest some foods and, and all that after so many G-forces. I think it's going to be a, the main worry for all of us uh, to see how many laps the neck uh, lasts. Only you know how tough Formula 1 is also nowadays with, with the speeds we're doing in high speed and the downforce we have. But um, at the same time, hopefully Austria is not such a bad track. If you suddenly put us in Singapore for our first race, I tell you a lot of people would really, 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 really struggle to make it to the finish. So um, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, hopefully you do a lot of laps in practice. Now I'm speculating, eh? but uh, in the ideal case, you get to do a lot of uh, laps in practice and more than 50, 60 laps to hit the neck properly, make sure you, you're sore on uh, Saturday and then for Sunday more or less the muscle has recovered and on Sunday you can put together a decent <laughs> strength muscle to, to, to make it to the finish. But it, trust me guys, it's going to be a, a big challenge for all of us because it's the only muscle in the body that you cannot really train in the gym. Even if you can keep it fit, you cannot really do exactly what you do in a Formula 1 car. Carlos, it's, it's very good to see you. Uh, thanks for joining us. But before we go, just, just a final one. Uh, obviously, being from a racing family, um, you would have been sad to hear that the news about Sir Sterling Moss, I'm sure your dad, um, you know, was very aware of his career. A any message you'd like to send out on that front, what he meant to you, what he meant to the, your father? Well, apart from, obviously, all my condolences to the family and friends um, uh, that for sure are, are missing Sterling now more than ever, I just wanted to say that for, for all of us drivers, he has been an icon, a reference, 
uh, a gentleman, um, especially, you know, and that we're all going to miss him a lot. I was trying to read a lot of stuff from, from him during this past week to try and, and find out more stuff about him. And, and honestly, I was very surprised with all the things I read. So uh, uh, rest in peace and uh, let's go racing together and give him a good uh, homage. Carlos, pleasure to see you as always. Thanks very much and uh, stay safe. We'll, we'll hopefully catch up with you again soon. Thank you very much, guys. I hope you are doing well and uh, see you soon, hopefully. Okay, let's bring in uh, next man on. Christian Horner joins us uh, from Horner Towers somewhere uh, in the vicinity of Silverstone. Christian, how are you? First things first, let's talk about the, the serious stuff. Jerry burnt last night's pizza or toad in the hole by the looks of things. Uh, I mean, how's that gone down with the rest of the yeah. family? It, lo it looked like she'd incinerated it. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the challenges of this, uh, you know, stay at home lark is, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the cooking challenges. So, um, yeah, there's been a few few things like that going on. But, you know, do you know I've never done so much trading all my life. Um, <laughs> so find, finding somewhere quiet in the house, as you well know, Simon, with a few youngsters, even Jensen as well, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's always something going on. You can always retire to the second largest kitchen garden in the UK. I mean, I've been to Hampton Court. That used to feed the, the court of Henry VIII. But I mean, I've been to your vegetable patch. How's that coming on? You, you can hide there. Go, you can do some stuff from there. Work from there. Yeah, yeah I was, do you know what? I was out there at the, at the weekend. It's, uh, got my old job back, you know, digging a few weeds out. Uh, it was like being back at school again. Got Monty on the tractor, yeah? Yeah, yeah. He, he's totally tractor obsessed at the moment. So, um, yeah, you, we'll get him in later. You can ask him. <laughs> JB? So uh, what, what have you been up to, Christian? Obviously, this has been a pretty weird time for us all. What's the, what's the one thing that you've learned about yourself over the last four weeks? <laughs> um, uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, the, the, the working at home has its limitations. Um, do you know what? It's been absolutely flat out. And um, there's been meetings. I've learned more about technology in the last three weeks and how to log in and do my own IT and Zoom meetings and WebEx and Christ knows whatever else. Um, but no, it's been, you know, it's been productive. Um, there's been a lot going on, a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, both within our own team, obviously with, you know, Liberty, with the FIA and, and so on. So yeah, generally it's been, been very, very busy. All the serious stuff, and then of course every night is karaoke night. I should imagine as well. <laughs> Something like that. But do you know what? Actually, I I saw uh, a post of Jensen's earlier today, and you did a, a the lap round Monza with a yeah. with a V10. Yeah, fantastic. fantastic. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it was a great lap as well. I love hearing the old V10s. It was, wasn't it? I, I watched. It, I was like, oh, I used to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you finish up though? Because you only showed half the lap. The first half of the lap looked great. I don't know what happened in the second half. I, I don't know. I actually stole it off someone else on Instagram. So I, I don't know what happened next. I might have to Google it. I can't remember actually what happened. But oh yeah, those V10s. Oh, at 19, 20,000 RPM. Yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. But things change. You know what? Absolutely. Like the P6s. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's come back to the serious stuff. Ted, first things first. Let's get a... Uh... A TED special, a sort of update on where we are with rules, with regulations, uh, going from this year going forward. Ted, go on. Yeah, Simon. So I thought, you know, it's been a it's been a month now since we would have had the Australian Grand Prix. It was uh, it's fifteenth of April as we speak, and it was going to be on the fifteenth of March. So I thought, new readers start here. We should explain what's going on. So all the teams are in are in their summer shutdown at the moment. They're taking thirty five days rather than what they would have done uh, just uh, three weeks. Uh, a little bit in normal seasons. But um, as Christian says, they're all talking, having discussions because there's a, there's a financial crisis. There's, a, there's, there's problems going on with Formula One teams. And, you know, a heart goes out to any of you watching who've got uh, difficulties in that area. You know, rest assured, Formula One teams are exactly the same. So it really is, it really is all about the money uh, for them and making sure we get through this crisis with 10 very healthy Formula One teams that we can go forward with the prize money here. So we have, just to explain what's going on to help that, we've got this year, 2021, 2022, and 2023. This is this year's car, and this is gonna be the new car that's coming in 
for 2021 originally, but now 2022. So what's going on now? Well, the FI have already said that when we get going eventually this year, we're going to have the cars that we use, but there might be some aerodynamic freeze on aerodynamic development so the teams don't have to spend so much money. So the front wing might stay the same, the floor and the diffuser might stay the same, maybe the rear wings, some other bits as well. And the car we're going to race eventually in 2020, we're also, to save money, going to race in 2021. Now, that's really important because, of course, the, the, the sponsorship uh, that teams get from their sponsors is paid this year. But the money they get from Formula One, the prize money and the appearance money is paid a year in arrears. And that means for 2021, there's going to be less money in the pot coming in to the Formula One teams. So that's why they're going to spend less money next year so they don't have to build new cars. But that means they're still going to have a, a bill going on because they need to build the new cars, the new generation F1 cars for 2022. And that, Simon, is where Christian Horner himself has been very vocal. He's been saying, look, why don't we defer all the costs that are going to be uh, accrued with developing next the, the new F1 cars with a ground effect? Why don't we defer that to 2023 here so we can have a year going through it. So uh, really that's, that's the situation. We had Zach Brown on with Ross Braun. Zach Brown was talking about whether they get more, mo more prize money from Formula One or whether they can save themselves, the teams can save themselves with the budget cap. And that's what's coming in. So maybe you can pick up with your budget cap, Simon. Yeah, well, well let's start with that. Where, where are we with everything right now? What's happening behind closed doors, Christian? Well, obviously, I mean, this, this crisis has had an effect on every single team, on every company in the world. And, um, you know, Red Bull is no, is no different. So, um, you know, at times like this, a little bit like the financial crisis, um, you know, back in 2008, it, it does galvanize the teams. And you have to start looking outside of your own interests and looking at the bigger picture and the bigger picture of, you know, the sport and all 10 teams surviving. We went through this in order to keep um, you know, when Honda withdrew, as Jensen well, you know, remembers, and, uh, uh, you know, back in 2008, and we made some drastic changes at that time, and the teams have been, you know, pretty decent in, in getting together and, and really focusing on the cost drivers, and that's the big teams, the medium-sized teams, and, and the little teams, and I think actually what's happened with the regs by freezing an awful lot of the car, probably 60% of the car is now frozen from 2020 into 2021. So it'll basically just be some aero updates between, between seasons. Um, I think it's absolutely the right thing to do if you, if you just focused on killing the cost. And as dear old Ron Dennis used to bang on, he said, if you want to save costs in this business, don't change anything. And he was absolutely right. And, and that's why I have a slight problem with introducing a, a complete overhaul of the car for 2022. You know, there's not a single component that is carryover from 2021 into 2022. We're going to be forced to go tar testing and build mule cars. And it just seems an unnecessary pressure on the system um, to, to put that cost into 2021. So I would have pushed the rules of a further year back into 2023. But, you know, if you're a team, for example, you know, Ferrari is saying, yeah, from a cost point of view, we get it, we agree, but, you know, we, we, our car might not be that competitive. We want a clean sheet of paper. And of course, you know, all the, all the, um, the, the teams further down the order think that a clean sheet of paper will change the pecking order. The reality is it will change nothing, but it will impose an awful lot of costs um, drivers into the business next year. So what about dropping the budget cap as Zach and a lot of McLaren guys have said down to, you know, in the, in the realms of a hundred million, is that, is that too much? I mean, I, obviously, as we said here, altruism is key. You, so everyone's going to be selfless for, for the business of Formula One to survive, haven't they, Christian? Otherwise, you know, if, we, if we're left with six teams, that's no good for anyone. And the big three need to give a bit, do they or not? No, absolutely. And look, you know, remember, the cap is just a ceiling of which to spend. It's not a necessity to spend. The regulations are what drive your cost. And I think we've done a, a pretty good job, certainly for 20 and 21. As I say, I'm concerned about 22. Now, putting a cap and a ceiling of, of, of cost in there, it's interesting. I've, I've been on all of the engine discussions, and they've, 
managed to get probably 30 to 40 percent out of their costs of the supply of these engines and not once was a budget cap mentioned in those discussions they've just focused on the on the cost drivers um, of course you know, it's very difficult to compare teams and a team like mercedes compared to a Haas or a Ferrari compared to a to a racing point or even a Red Bull compared to an Alfa Tori. They're completely different beasts. And those three, if you like, top teams are also supplying four of the, the teams at the back of the grid, you know, as well. And so if we were to go to a complete extreme, I would have no issue at all for a short term period for one or two years to say to the smaller teams, do you know what? Let's get rid of all of your R&D costs. Let's get rid of everything that you just need to be a race team and we will sell you our car in Abu Dhabi. Take that car. And that would be their quickest way to be competitive at a low, at a low cost. Now that would probably deal with four of the teams. Um, Haas, you would think, Alfa Tori for sure. Um, Sauber probably, Racing Point. And then, you know, they're all trying to copy each other's cars anyway. So it then leaves those teams in the middle sector you know um, mclaren and uh, and and renault that are the that are the odd ones out but it's always going to be impossible to get a compromise that suits suits everybody so therefore a lot of focus has been put on the cap at the moment when it's actually the cost drivers that are where the most emphasis needs to be what does the cap cover i mean that's obviously very broad but uh, obviously some teams have got much bigger overheads than than others yeah absolutely i mean the cap covers if you like the operational costs of going racing it excludes the drivers it excludes marketing um you know and there are other other exclusions as as well there and i think that you know it's impossible to compare you know factories for example if you think of the mclaren factory compared to a you know to a Haas factory um you know, those operational costs are just completely, completely different. You know, at Red Bull, we are over 900 people to produce the cars that we do. Now, if we're coming down in significant steps to the kind of levels that, we, that are being talked about, that, you know, that could be 300, you know, 300, 350 people that we're talking about, obviously having to resize to. And the same with Ferrari, probably more and probably even more at at Mercedes. So it's finding, that, it's finding that balance. And of course, one of the things you've got to look at is, is it right that all teams should have the same cap? You know, for example, a team that is buying components at the back of the grid, you know, that don't have the R&D costs, should they have the same cap as, you know, a manufacturer team? But Christian, that's probably how this is going to get sorted out, isn't it? Nobody wants to see any teams go under. So uh, the supplier teams who've got all the R&D costs, so yourselves, Mercedes and Ferrari, you're probably going to have a budget cap there, plus the R&D top up, really, aren't you? And then the other teams are going to have the budget cap there, minus the R&D top up. Is that where you see this being uh, sorted out? I think so. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're also looking at is, okay, how can you give the other teams and the mid teams a, a bit of a leg up as well? So if you said, for example, the top three teams, uh, you know, have a certain amount of time in the wind tunnel and CFD and, and the teams from fourth to seventh have, uh, you know, more time available to them if they're working at a lower budget. Uh, and then, then the same again for the, for the last three teams. But if you really are serious about taking cost out of this sport, I would have thought if I was Finn Rousing or Gene Haas and I had the opportunity to go and buy a Ferrari or a Red Bull or a Mercedes and just run a race team for a couple of years, that's what I'd do. Okay, well, well let's move on to, uh, you know, Ross Braun's master plan, shortened weekends, um, when we think it's going to start amongst the team principals, uh, amongst, you know, senior management on all sides. There is talk that potentially Austria, your home race, might be able to be run beginning of July, behind closed doors, without fans, is that the right thing to do? And do you see that as being feasible, certainly from your side, from Red Bull's perspective? Well, I think, you know, the Red Bull ring is literally, you can turn the lights on there. It's a ready-made facility. It can be ready in a very short period of time to fit the FIA's, you know, criteria. So, you know, the prospect of being able to run a race behind closed doors is absolutely, you know, feasible. And of course, as sanctions start to get lifted and, and um, 
things start to hopefully loosen up as we start to hopefully come out of this this crisis how willing are people going to be to want to go and sit in a crowd of 150,000 people um so i think there is going to be a staged um you know route back into full on grand prix and you know there's certain circuits that are talking about you know crowdless um events potentially just focusing on 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 tv events for now with limited numbers of people limited operative staff there as a way you know to get the championship going and i think you know football and other sports are also considering the same route and of course formula 1 there is more you know distance between the competitors they've got helmets on you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so there is that that natural distancing as well so you know it's something that that austria and red bull are, are, are looking at but of course they have to work with the local authorities and the governments and uh, and so at the moment it's just under discussion yeah, obviously, as you said, not many people are going to want to go out uh, initially when the uh, isolation um, ban has, you know, uh, has lifted. Uh, but I, I think it's great because it means that people are, that are still at home and, and don't feel safe to go outside, they've got something to watch live. I mean, we're all searching for things to watch on TV yeah. these days and trying to find something live is, uh, is almost impossible. So um, I think that'd be great. Uh, for the teams, though, it's going to be pretty tough. Um, it looks like it's going to be three weeks on, one week off. That's what's been talked about. It's going to be tough, isn't it? Three weeks back to back to back. It is going to be tough. Hang on, I think I've got... Is that Monty? <laughs> We're still back. <laughs> can, can I say hello? We've got... <laughs> on, He's got a crash helmet. He's ready to go. Can I say hey, hi? First. Can I say hi? Who can... He... Right. Uh, Monty. Hey. Hi, Monty. You see, you see this young one there? Or just take your helmet off. <laughs> Why have you got a crash helmet on? Because I'm going back on my thingy. You can't back on Okay. Have you been on your tractor, Monty? Yeah. What's your favourite tractor? Mm -hmm. Who? John Deere. They John can't Deere. hear. What cup is it? And who's your favourite driver? Oh. <laughs> oh, very good. Well trained. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's not as if you set that up. Yeah, exactly. Well, almost. That's not pronounced Verstappen. But he's only a little bit younger than Verstappen, so. Uh, good right, stuff. let me just get rid of him and I'll be, well, one second, we'll cut this bit up. One okay. second. I'll leave him be. Because actually an interesting point is that, the, 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 that Christian was making there. I mean, look, we'd all like to see, um, see us going racing behind closed doors. I suppose there is the costs to the promoters to take into, into account there. You know, how are you going to make any money back on this? But also, they need decisions early, otherwise they've got to start spending the money. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, if I can coin a cliche. Yeah, and I think that, look, I think if we just get a stake in the ground, it will give then perhaps other promoters, hopefully, um, some confidence to get going. Um, you know, there's still a confidence that we can get 18 races in between you know, beginning of July and the end of the year, and, and, and that will be a flat-out championship. So, you know, it's going to be tough for the staff. It's going to be tough for, you know, the travellers, uh, you, you know, in the team as well to, 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 to cope with that. But, you know, I think when we do get going, it's going to come thick and fast and going to be a, a mighty challenge. Yeah, let's, let's hope so. I think everybody's looking forward to it. If we do get it, it's going to be a real adrenaline rush on top of what we usually get, isn't it? Because we're, they're going to be coming, yeah. as you said, um, uh, but we're all going a bit uh, crazy. I mean, I was even sucked into one of those e-games the other day. I was watching Jensen um, performing brilliantly. Um, <laughs> but even that starts to draw you in. You're so desperate for some racing. Uh, I was even sucked into that, in, into that the other day. I mean, I'm, I apologise on our driver's behalf for almost taking you out. But um... <laughs> <laughs> it was good fun. Uh, it's good fun. It's, it's weird, isn't it? We're suddenly watching live computer games unbelievable you know there's that thirst for comp competition and sport and and so on which the whole world is being starved of at the moment and i think that's why if formula one can take a bit of a lead and and responsibly get back to doing some racing i think it would be a great thing brilliant stuff right well let's um finish if we could with a with a positive story and obviously as part of project pit lane christian i want to bring in um a chap that you've been working with a uh, junior doctor by the name of Alistair Darwood, who I think can uh, join us on the uh, on the podcast right now. Um, and Alistair, of course, has been working with yourselves, with Bob Bell, um, with Rob Marshall, with a, a few of the gang 
up there in Milton Keynes in producing um, a ventilator um, that, that can actually be taken from concept through to prototype, and they've done it in three weeks. Thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Alistair. I really appreciate it. Just tell us, if you could, your experience of, of actually getting this all the way through, as you said, to the prototype in such a short space of time and what it was like working with these incredible engineers. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me uh, on the show. Um, it's certainly been a, a very steep learning curve o over the last few weeks. And um, if I give a bit of the background, this invention started as a device designed primarily as a very small scale, very low cost emergency ventilator that was really designed for patients um, in, in a trauma setting to say, take someone from a car crash and transport them to a hospital or off the side of a mountain. And um, through uh, Innovate UK and the Clinical Entrepreneur Programme, uh, we were linked up with what was an amazing government initiative to link clinical innovations with world-class engineering to produce a prototype very, very quickly. Um, and this device was uh, introduced at the very first meeting with Bob Bell and Andy Damer at, at, at Red Bull. Um, and they introduced this invention to all of the teams involved at Project Pit Lane. And uh, the, the short story, I guess, is we worked very, very quickly in a breakneck speed to create a fully functional prototype of this invention. Um, it's been an incredible journey. And, and I, th I think the three things that have most impressed me about working with the teams is an absolutely astounding ability to problem solve on the fly with a work ethic that uh, certainly on par and you know, exceeding everything I see uh, in the NHS or in, my, in, in clinical practice. Um, the, the, the engineers are working 18 hour days, day after day after day. I think it's been one consecutive work day since about March. Um, it, it's incredibly impressive and inspiring to see. Um, and finally, the speed of development has been phenomenal. We would go home and come back in the next day and a new prototype was made, a new prototype had been tested on the same test rigs that are used to develop Formula One components, um, simulating the, the processes that this device would go through to deliver breaths to a patient on the same rigs that, are, that, that stress, stress test uh, spoilers for, for cars and aerodynamic components. So it was really amazing to see and an amazing experience. Well, all credit to you, Alistair and, uh, and, and, and Christian and all your engineers, both at Red Bull Racing and Milton Keynes and uh, to Enstone at Renault, who collaborated with Alistair. Just interested, you know, people hear a lot about ventilators and, and what is a ventilator effectively? Is it like a giant air pump? And, and, and what were the facilities as well as the know-how and the, 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 the rapid development you've already spoken about, Alistair, that Red Bull and Renault had, which have helped you so much? So I'll, I'll, I'll take the first question first of all. So in its most basic form, a ventilator is a posh pump. It's a device which uh, compresses air into a patient's lungs, expanding them a, bit, a little bit like a balloon, and then lowers the pressure, allowing the lungs to elastically recoil to allow the air to come out of the lungs, to, to allow patients to exhale. And there's a large breadth of technologies that go into making ventilators, ranging from turbine fans that generate airflow um, in the same way as a turbocharger, in a, in, a, in a car, uh, to uh, static pistons, which will compress air inside cylinders to uh, pump air in, into a patient, um, or to devices like such, such as our one, which effectively compressed a small um, deformable uh, airbag that in, in a very controlled manner to create that, that positive pressure to drive it into a patient's lungs. Um, and there's obviously a huge amount of, of control theory that goes into controlling these devices and making sure they're safe because when a patient is um, sedated to allow them to, to uh, sort of manage on a ventilator, uh, our lungs are a very fragile organ. So it's, it's important that whatever device we're plugging them into is very safe and it's fit for the job of, of ventilating that patient. Um, and as far as how we worked and how this was developed at the, um, with, with the Project Pit Lane teams, it was really taking uh, engineering concepts and having the ability to immediately test them and stress test them for the lifetime of repetitive actions that they'd have to do to make sure they're fit for purpose. And I guess that's something which, uh, in my, my limited understanding of Formula One, um, is, is also crucial in, in your industry. Yeah, so I think, it up, Christian, yeah. yeah, I think what I'd like to add is that, I mean, obviously Alistair came up with this, this design and I've never seen anything like it where competitive um uh, you know nature has been put to one side and you know in milton Keynes, we house side by side 
you know, Renault, uh, you know, Enstone employees. We had you know, all their volunteers. We had over 200 of our own volunteers working nonstop on this project, you know, working side by side, you know, with each other. So for all the differences that, that um, Cyril and I have had uh, over the years, our teams came together, um, you know, in a rebel factory with the mechanics working side by side in their different uniforms for one cause. And, you know, guys, you know, like Bob Bell and, and, and particular Rob Marshall, you know, just working night after night to come up with solutions you know, on the hoof to keep this project driving forward. And it was, it was phenomenal to see, phenomenal. Absolutely. And, and just from your perspective, as we we're saying, it's, it's there, it's, it's ready to go. This is a working prototype. Should the government uh, take it up, then, then it's there and, it, and it's ready for them, yeah? Absolutely. I think it, it's excellent news, as Matt Hancock was saying over the last few days, that um, the ventilator requirement has dropped from uh, 30,000 to, I believe, the, the current figure is 18,000. And that gives the country breathing space to uh, take the advice from, from the government's um, uh, sort of clinical advisors to better target the ventilators to the complex uh, care of these coronavirus patients. And the lovely thing about this ventilator is it can stand as a backup device. And certainly something I'd like to see is this, this helping countries who perhaps don't have the access to ventilators that we do. Um, but absolutely, you're quite right. It, it's, it's ready to go. And of course, it needs a little bit more work to get through the final stages, but the design is there and, and, and ready, to, ready to work. Alistair, um, I think on behalf of us all, can we first just say thank you for, for the work that you guys and everybody in the NHS are doing. And it, it's great to see everything um, coming to fruition for you and let's hope that um, yeah let's hope it's actually not needed uh, and we get through this but uh, brilliant work anyway so thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing that story it's, it's magnificent uh, Christian Jensen um, just to finish with with you before we go obviously it's been another well another sad story in motorsport this week with the loss of Sir Sterling Moss um, we've been getting everybody's reactions we had Sir Jackie on on, on Monday and Damon and, and, and Martin everybody paying tributes but just your your final thoughts on Sir Sterling, the legend that he was. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it, it, you know, you, you kind of know it's coming when someone's in their, their 90s and obviously Sterling uh, wasn't well for a little while, but uh, it's still a massive shock. Um, Sterling was always very helpful through my career uh, from the, you know, the very early days in, in my Formula One career. And when I knew Sterling was in the paddock or was on the grid, he was always the person I would look for um, for a little chat with. And um, it, was, it was always a, a fun conversation about uh, the old boys or, or the crumpet on the grid, as he used to say. <laughs> um, but he, he used to send me texts quite often, actually. When I was nearing the end of my F1 career, he was, he was you know, giving me advice of, of how it's going to be after and, and what I should do. And, he was, he was saying that I should try, try Indy out. He said, you'd go over there and you would win immediately. I don't think that was true. But uh, it, was, it was nice to have advice from someone that had so much experience. Um, and he was such a, just a, such a lovely man. He, he really was. Um, Goodwood won't be the same without him. You know, Goodwood, that was his event, basically. You know, <laughs> having him there and driving in his 80s and competing in his 80s. I mean... Uh, this guy was such a competitive individual, um, but so so lovely with it. Such a gentleman. Yeah, founding father of British motorsport. A lot of people would say, Christian. Yeah, look, I mean, I just echo everything you know Jensen says, and yeah, he was just the most wonderful character. I mean, obviously, I never got to see him race. I saw films and read about his racing and so on at a time when it was so so dangerous. And yeah, he was obviously an outstanding driver, but also, you know, a, a gentleman as well. And he was just so much fun. He was an absolute legend. And, uh, you know, he always had a, a comment. He always had a, a cheeky story. Um, he was somebody that, um, you know, drivers like Jensen could only aspire to be like during their time racing with his off-track activities. Were, were legendary. Um, and... Um, I think that, you know, he was, you know, Mr. Motor Racing and he was such a big character and Goodwood, as Jensen rightly says, was his event. I remember actually doing a race at Goodwood and, and starting the race alongside him and thought he must have been well into his 80s at that point and he's still out qualified. Um, <laughs> and I thought I better give him, you know, a bit of space into the first corner. And the old bugger had me straight on the grass. He'd lost none of his... 
none of his competitive instinct in a Lotus Cortina at 83 years of age or whatever it was. So just a wonderful, wonderful character and a, you know, a, a great loss for, for the sport and obviously for his family. I think the highest praise we can give to Sterling was to say that, that he was a racer, wasn't he, guys? I mean, you know, he was the ultimate... He was the ultimate racer. And that was kind of the, the highest honor he could give to any drivers that he saw out there. I remember Jensen, he used to talk about you. He said, you're a racer, but you're, you're an intelligent racer as well. Whereas he was just someone who would go out. And of course he was intelligent. You don't win the number of races he did and the Mille Emilio without being smart. But uh, that was kind of the, the, the highest honor he could give someone. Is that, you know what about him? He's a racer. And when you knew you had Sterling's seal of approval like that, you knew you'd do something right. Absolutely. Boys, it's been a pleasure to have you all on uh, this latest Sky F1 podcast. Uh, Christian, we'll leave you to get back to Tractors, to Monty, to the Garden, and to, yeah, to I should imagine, a, a load more of these type of calls uh, with the powers that be. So thank you for sparing us an hour of your time. We really appreciate it. Jensen, uh, we'll leave you to it too. And Ted, a big thank you as well. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Uh, thanks. Bye-bye.